So let's look at another one. f at x is equal to 1 over x squared plus 1. Same procedure, the domain is going to be all real numbers. Careful with this one. But you'll see that x squared plus 1, if you set it equal to 0, the denominator, x squared equal to negative 1, impossible. So you can sub any number you want in for x. There will be no restriction on it. It can be anything. The intercepts Um, the y-intercept, set x equal to 0, and 0, oops, I mean f at 0 is equal to 1 over 0 squared plus 1. So f at 0 is equal to 1 over 1. It's just 1. So 0 comma 1. And then your x-intercept, or intercepts, at y equal to 0. So 0 is equal to 1 over x squared plus 1. And there are no, there's no way this can be equal to 0. So there are no x-intercepts. Then we move on to um, asymptotes. For asymptotes, when we try to find a vertical asymptotes, well, there's no way that x squared plus 1 is going to be equal to 0, so there are no vertical asymptotes. And then if we take a look at the horizontal asymptotes, we take the limit as x increases or decreases without bound of this function 1 over x squared plus 1. And you pay attention to that one without even doing any simplification on it. If x increases without bound or decreases without bound, add 1 to it, well, 1 divided by all that is going to be 0. So the denominator increases and the numerator stays at 1. So 1 divided by an increasing denominator is going to get closer and closer to 0. So therefore the horizontal asymptote is, I'll just go HA, is Y is equal to 0. And now we are ready for local extrema which is first derivative analysis. Oops. There we are. So first derivative analysis will require us to get the first derivative. So f at x is equal to, if we wrote it in a more convenient form, we would write that as x squared plus 1 to the negative 1. So the derivative f prime at x is equal to negative x squared plus 1 to the negative 2 multiplied by the derivative of the inner, which is 2x. So f prime at x is equal to negative 2x over top of x squared plus 1 to the 2. So we go after the critical numbers. So where is f prime at x equal to 0? Well, 0 will be equal to negative 2x over x squared plus 1 to the 2. And 0 is equal to the numerator, so negative 2x. So we're going to get x is equal to 0 for a critical number. And f prime at x doesn't exist. 
Well, that would be the denominator that interests us. So x squared plus 1 squared equal to 0. And we've already seen this equation before. Take the square root of both sides. So x squared equal to negative 1. It's not going to happen. So what this is telling us then is there's no critical numbers produced this way. So our only critical number is x equals 0. So we go to our number line, mark that off, and um, we have negative 2x for the 1 factor. We have x squared plus 1 to the 2, and then we have f prime at x. So careful with this. If x is larger than 0, multiply by negative 2 will give us a negative value and then positive to the left. And then x squared plus 1 squared is positive everywhere. So we're positive there, we're negative there. So the graph is increasing until it gets to 0 and then it's decreasing. So there is a local max at x is equal to 0. And if we find the y-coordinate for f at 0, we will get um, right into the original 1 over 0 squared plus 1. So f at 0 is equal to 1. So there is our max, 0 comma 1. So that's helpful. And now we can turn our attention towards the second derivative. Now the second derivative of analysis second derivative analysis here's our first derivative, negative 2x over 1 plus x squared to the 2. Oops, I don't know why I wrote in that order, but it doesn't really matter. And now when we do the second derivative, you probably want to use the product rule or a quotient rule, excuse me. So u is equal to negative 2x, u prime is equal to negative 2, v is equal to 1 plus x squared to the 2, and then v prime is equal to 2 times 1 plus x squared multiplied by the derivative of the inner, which is 2x, so v prime is equal to 4x multiplied by 1 plus x squared. Therefore, y prime is equal to u prime, so negative 2 times v, which is 1 plus x squared to the 2, minus um, u, which is negative 2x, times v prime, which is 4x, multiplied by 1 plus x squared. Then over v squared, Careful with this, this is 1 plus x squared to the 2, and then all this being raised to the 2. Do the mopping up as is necessary. Um, you could distribute all that in, or you could just look for a common factor right away. Um, you're, you've got several choices with this one. You could either take out a 2, or you could take out um, a negative 2. It's not going to make an awful lot of difference. So if you do take out a um, factor of negative 2, you, and then also take out a 1 plus x squared, will leave you with 
1 plus x squared. Now, when you take out this factor of 2, that's going to leave you with a factor of 4x squared. But watch your sign, because it is actually a positive, so when you take out the negative, it's going to become negative. And then this is all over 1 plus x squared to the 4. So finally, when this is done, um, you get a, a, some interesting results emerging from this. So the negative 2 can stay. Now the 1 plus x squared will divide out, and that leaves you with 1 minus 3x squared all over top of 1 plus x squared to the 3. And now we have to do our analysis on this one. So I'm going to write this up a little bit above this. Potential points of inflection are going to occur where the second derivative is equal to 0 or where the second derivative doesn't exist. So 0 is equal to the numerator, which is negative 2 times 1 minus 3x squared divided by negative 2 and you bring the 3x squared over you get 3x squared is equal to 1 so x squared is equal to 1 over 3 so x is equal to 1 over square root 3 plus or minus so this one is not really looking that good now I'm going to keep it as an exact value however I will um, decimalize it for my own work. So that's about equal to 0.58. Might come in handy later on. Now the other ones is where this does not exist and we're at the same position we've been before. There's no points of inflection where the second derivative doesn't exist. There's no way that that denominator can be equal to zero. We've been through it two times already. So it means that the only numbers we have to concern ourselves with are positive one over root three and then negative one over root three. And then try to do the analysis as, as before. Now we run into a bit of a problem and the, if you take all the factors, we have negative 2, and we have 1 minus 3x squared, and then we have 1 plus x squared to the 3. And we have to decide how we're going to do that. Um, and this is where things get a little bit awkward, because when we have um, 1 over root 3, what we can do to write this one is we can either break it into two small factors, which is normal, or we can keep it together as 1 minus 3x squared. Now, I'm going to cheat a little bit with this one. I don't like to do this, but if you keep it in this form, as long as we're really careful, we'll be okay. And then I'll put 1 plus x squared to the 3 below that, and then I'll do the second derivative. Now, this is not normally, you normally don't like to have things in quadratic form like that but I'll show you how we can deal with it. So the negative 2, of course, is negative everywhere. In retrospect, if you just divided out a positive 2 when you're factoring it instead of a negative 2, it would have been easier. But I'm sticking with what I have. And then the 1 plus x squared to the 3, I'm going to jump to the easy one. This is going to be positive everywhere, not because of the exponent 3, but because of the exponent 2. So you pick any number for x squared, it's automatically positive. So then when you add 1 and cube it, it, has, it doesn't do anything. And then, when this, we have this 1 minus 3x squared to the exponent of 2, we very carefully select values in these intervals and see what happens with it. So if you picked a number bigger than 0.58, say 1, and then you went 1 minus 3 times 1 squared, um, you are going to notice that um, your factor is going to be 
negative in that interval. So be very careful. Pick a number, let's just said like one, a nice easy one to work with, and then select it. So use a test value for it. And then pick a number between negative um, 1 over root 3, negative 0.58, and um, positive, say 0, and 1 minus 3 times 0 squared is going to be positive. And then if you pick a number that is less than negative 1 over root 3, then um, you'll also get negative when you squared. So this is risky, but it does work. And that means the second derivative is positive there, is negative there, and is positive in that interval. So positive with the two negatives means it's concave up. One negative, concave down, and then concave up. So what this is telling us is that there is a point of inflection right there. And then another point of inflection right there. Now I'm going to bring up a new screen to get some space for this one. However, it um, we have all the information that we really are going to be able to get with this, except for the y coordinates, which I will do on the on the screen or the next screen. So to find the points of inflection, the y coordinates, we take x is equal to one over root three, and we substitute it into the function. So f at one over root three is equal to 1 over 1 over root 3 squared plus 1. So that's 1 over 1 third plus 1. And 1 third plus 1 is 4 thirds. So when you take the reciprocal of that, you'll get 3 quarters. So f at 1 over root 3 is equal to, the, to that value. And then f at negative 1 over root 3 simply requires you to put the same number in, and you'll get 3 over 4. Which reminds me, in all this fuss, I didn't note that it was symmetric. But I'm, I don't worry, I'm not going to worry about it now. But this illustrates that the graph is actually symmetric about the y-axis. And this is what we're going to get. Here's our max of 1. And no x-intercepts. And you see that in this region, it's pretty clearly it's concave down. And then it changes to concave up at. It's a little tough to tell off the graph, of course. But here's concave up. But this point there, this point of inflection, would be negative 1 over root 3, comma 3 quarters. And then this other point of inflection would be positive 1 over root 3, comma, 3 quarters. So we end up with a pretty nice looking graph. And I will note this function is even. Because if you had gone f at negative x into this, 1 over negative x squared plus 1, this turns into 1 over x squared plus 1. So f at negative x is equal to f at x, which means even, which is symmetric. with respect to the y-axis. So it's a pretty good looking graph. So that's it for this part. Um, the remaining graphs on that page will be done on another video, but this has already taken us a while. So thank you for your time.